check, check. Are we on? We good? We good? Okay. All right. Well, let's hope this thing actually records this time instead of doing what it's been doing. Okay. Somebody was looking for uh, an employee to hire, so they put out a, a wanted ad. And this is how it read. Wanted. Part-time salesperson who won't quit after two months, who works hard and doesn't think she's doing me a favor by working here, who can take a joke and won't cry every day on the floor. <laughs> Inquire within. Seems like he or she wanted something really, really specific. Sometimes you just need something, a, a very specific set of skills to get the job done. Right, Liam Neeson? Right? You've got to have just that right person. Like the high priest in the Bible, the head honcho, the spiritual big cheese, the chemosabi, the very reverend doctor, and whoever the high priest was that year. I mean, the high priest was a really big deal uh, when the temple was functional. He was the one overseeing uh, with authority over all of the priests to make sure that worship was being conducted properly. Another battery would be great. That's right, she's got to be able to catch, and that I don't trust at all. <clears throat> okay, let me know if it does that again, because as long as you hear me through those speakers, it's recording for, uh, for the video. If you don't hear me coming through the speakers, all of a sudden they're not going to hear anything out of that video. Right, Bill? Right, because he put, and he always lets me know, because he goes home on Sunday and he and Pat play the video, and if, if it's not coming through, if it's not directly connected to the video camera, and it's just like whatever comes through the speakers and manages to get to the camera, yeah, you're just not going to hear enough. So, anyway, so we're going to talk about qualifications for the high priest and who can meet those qualifications from Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 1 in a moment, but the ideal candidate for the high priest position, one, erases all wrongdoing. Erases all wrongdoing. And everybody's wrongdoing, including his own wrongdoing. I mean, he sins, they sin, and he comes and represents the people before God with sin offerings. Look at 5 verse 1 of Hebrews. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now, if you happen to be the one appointed for this responsibility, do not wear your Sunday best to work. Okay? They're going to get messy. Because this was back in the days of animal sacrifice. And without those... Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, it's going to say in 922 of Hebrews. So this was, but it wasn't just that. It was, it was an enormous amount of responsibility that related to representing people before God. Um, this one man, once a year, represented all God's people by coming into God's presence in the Holy of Holies with sacrificial blood and all that stuff. So... Um, so that's one qualification, okay? He had, to be, he had to erase all wrongdoing. That's one of his responsibilities. So he had to be someone qualified to do that. Second, uh, the ideal candidate for high priest, the high priest position is more sympathetic than Dr. Phil at a victim's panel, okay? Highly sympathetic person. So look at verses 2 and 3. 
He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. Um, when I was in third grade, um, I, uh, I didn't always smell as fresh as a daisy, apparently. And um, I don't think I want to tell you why. Um, well, I didn't shower very well in the morning, and I, I occasionally had a bedwetting problem at that age. So, because I slept like a just a just a lumberjack, and so I just slept right through it. So I'd get up, and if I didn't get myself quite clean enough, I smelled like it to my classmates, who you know how diplomatic third grade boys are. You know, they're always so kind to overlook an offense. No, they they prey upon any weakness, right? And they just started calling me skunk. And it just galled me. It got on my nerves, and this went on for a while. I don't know how long, days or weeks. I, but I just wasn't the kind to sit back and be bullied. So one day, I met recess. We're in the gymnasium of our Catholic school. And John happened by with a bunch of other, other guys in my class. And they started in on me again. And John was the pack leader. So as soon as he calls me skunk, the rest of them start calling me skunk. And I just got irate. And I jumped on that dude and tackled him to the ground. And we're struggling around. And a couple of teachers break up the fight. And oddly enough, they don't take us to the office or you know, really punish us. They kind of just broke up the fight. Went back to class, and in the afternoon, one of those nuns rolled on into the classroom and saw a mark bleeding or whatever on John's face and said, what happened? And she starts snooping around like, you know, Barney Fife or something, some detective. And she's pretty soon, you know, I'm the one, you know. And so, you know, we go to the office, and they suspend us for the next day of school. And I thought when I got home that I was going to get my hide tanned. I was going to get, oh man, I, I, was, I was just done. But surprisingly, Dad did not throw the book at me. And I later learned why he didn't throw the book at me, because he had the same weakness. He got into fight after fight after fight. I mean, I could tell you stories about his fights, because he told these stories with you know, great vividness years later. Huh? I'm off again? We're on. Okay. So, because Dad had the same weakness I did, he had a, a lot more empathy about this sort of stuff. My mother was not so burdened, however, so I did get what was coming to me. But Dad, Dad was the high priest. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I deserve to get punished. Dad went too easy on me. Mom gave me justice, I guess, in that case. So, in any case, um, but there's still this thought that you're going to have more sympathy for people who have weaknesses where they've experienced weakness, and if they're not massively, like, you know how you can be a hypocritical, fault-finding person and go after people's faults who have the same fault you have. And that's really weird. That's, that's like I said, hypocritical and fault-finding. But the more humble, reasonable thing is to sympathize and empathize with those who struggle with some of the same things you do. And so the high priest was supposed to be empathetic. The ideal candidate for the high priest position is appointed by God. So if he hasn't contacted you about it, don't bother applying. Okay? He'll call you, don't call him. Right? Verse 4, And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. Now Aaron, of course, was Moses' brother. Uh, so Moses is the more famous of the two brothers, but Aaron was the one that God chose to be the high priest. And then, of course, you know, he was a part of the tribe. There were 12 tribes of Israel. And he was a Levite. So God chose the tribe of the Levites to serve as priests. And then God appointed who was going to be the high priest 
from among the Levites. The point, now here's the thing. All of Israel was called by God to be a kingdom of priests, right? You've read Exodus 19, 5 and 6. The whole nation was called to be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. They all had spiritual responsibilities related to worship, witness, um, fighting against evil, fighting for good and for justice and this sort of thing. And yet, like every group of people, they needed leadership. And so God appointed leadership. He provided for leadership by appointing the Levites and then appointing specifically who he wanted to be the head of the, the priest, the chief priest. Now, you might think God called Aaron because of how famously good Aaron was. Well, you'd be wrong. Because remember, Aaron was the one who threw Israel's gold into the fire that spontaneously erupted in a golden calf. Remember, that was his story to Moses. I just threw the gold in the fire, and out came this calf. So often, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. You see the difference? He doesn't look for some super person to do what he wants done. Very often he calls Joe Blow or Jane Blow and just works on them until they're able to do what he wants. He empowers them, he guides them, he trains them. He qualifies them. He raises them up to do this. And that's what he did with the high priest very often. Now, we want to talk about how Jesus not only meets but exceeds these qualifications for high priest. So let's talk about how Jesus is even better than the ideal candidate for high priest. Jesus, one, is appointed by God, so feel free to pursue other positions if you've applied. Okay, so verses 5 and 6. In the same way, Jesus did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. Glory, okay, there's a responsibility, but there's also a, an honor accorded to the person with that responsibility. Jesus didn't take that for his own. But God, the Father, said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Quoting Psalm 2.7. So God, the Father, appointed Jesus for this responsibility. And it's really specific in this next verse, verse 6. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110, verse 4, which is going to get quoted some more times in Hebrews. Now, instead of explaining to you the order of Melchizedek, um, now I'm going to just this is this sermon is really more of an appetizer about the high priest stuff. Chapter seven is going to be the main course about the high priest stuff, and I'll go into more detail about Melchizedek and that order and all this kind of thing at that point. But for right now, the point is Jesus did not take upon himself the glory of being a high priest. The Father gave him that glorious responsibility and the honor that came with it of being the high priest. That was the Father's call. We usually think of Jesus as Savior, right? If you say, okay, what is Jesus to you? And you might think friend, Savior. You might think um, King. I hope you think King because Christ is not his last name. Christ is his title. Jesus, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christ. And that means what? The Anointed King. Okay? So that's like his role, his title. And if anything, I mean, if, if anything, I've tried to emphasize Christ as king because I tend to emphasize stuff that I think is most neglected. I don't know what that is. I don't know. What that is. That? It's it's touching that. Okay. I bet it's because it's touching that. Got it. Okay. Sorry about that. More audio issues than usual. We are we are triangulating them. We're working on them. All right. All right. Um, so I was talking about Jesus as the perfect candidate for high priest. God appointed him. Okay. Um, <clears throat> 
So we think of Jesus as Savior, we think of him as friend, as, as Redeemer, as King, but we also need to learn what it means that Jesus is also a high priest. That's going to be another dimension of what Jesus has done for you. And learning about that is going to learn, is going to teach us about, one, our, our specific needs, okay? And then how Jesus meets those specific needs. And so it's going to be the, the occasion to be even more grateful towards him. It's going to build upon our worship and dependence and gratitude to him, okay? All right, so another thing where Jesus um, qualifies as the ideal candidate, Jesus is so sympathetic, he makes Dr. Phil look like Jack the Ripper. I mean, he makes Dr. Phil look like Mr. Insensitivity. Consider verses 7 and 8 of chapter 5 here. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Now, consider Jesus the night he was betrayed in Gethsemane, and he's praying to the Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me, the cup of suffering. The, the wrath of God on the cross, okay? Did God take that cup from him? No. Jesus had to drink fully of the wrath and suffering on the cross. Yet, did God save him from death? Yes. Because this phrase can be understood as what, what actually happened, that Jesus was dead and Jesus was saved out of death by his resurrection. So the Father did answer Jesus' prayers. The Father did not truly forsake Jesus on the cross. His, I mean, the fa yeah, the, the wrath of the Father was poured out on him, but, he, after, but having died, the Father accepted the sacrifice from this righteous and perfect Son, and he raised him from the dead and vindicated him. As, as the king. So, but this was an act of high priestly uh, sacrifice. Jesus was at once the high priest who offered the sacrifice and the sacrifice itself and the temple in which the sacrifice was offered. If you follow the typology, he's all of those things. Okay. But again, we're going to get into that more in chapter 7. Well, we, as we experience suffering and tears and the need to be rescued, so Jesus experienced suffering and tears and the need to be rescued. Okay? When you need God most, do you come fervently to Him in prayer? Fervently. I mean, or do you just mouth a mealy mouth little kind of prayer halfway? I mean, do you come to Him passionately, like the psalmist, just, God, where are you? you know, how long will you let me suffer forever? Do you come with, with fervency? Do you come with tears when you're at your worst? Or do you reserve your emotions and keep those back from God? So Jesus came with full fervency. His, his tears were like were as blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he also came with reverent submission to God's will, to the Father's will. Jesus is asking for this cup to be taken from him, but saying... Not my will, but you will be done. That's reverent submission. Father, if you decide that this needs to happen, then as much as I might not want to, I'm going to do this. Is that how you come when you pray? When you pray and you say, Lord, what, which way do you want me to go, right or left? If you are not willing to go right, if God says right, if you're only willing to go left, that's not reverent submission. We've got to come to God with open hearts to whatever God is leading us to do. A comp I mean, the willingness to do God's will, that is hard. It's, it's really hard. Because God's will, yes, is good, pleasing, and perfect, but it doesn't always appear that way before you do it. Does that make sense? I mean, going left might look terrible to you now, but if you take some steps down that road, you begin to see what the Lord was working at, and it starts to work, and 
And then you say, you, boy, you're glad you took that route, but it doesn't always look that way from foresight. You have to actually obey and look at it through hindsight. Okay, um, verses four, uh, ver chapter 4, verse 14 through 16 goes into this empathy of Jesus a little bit more. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, it's hard for us to imagine that Jesus was really tempted like we are. You think about the things we're tempted by, petty irritation and impatience with other people's faults and foibles. Well, Jesus seemed very patient with other people, um, so he doesn't seem vulnerable to that. Gossip, you know, we gossip. Can you imagine Jesus being tempted to share a little tidbit with people in his community? Uh, lust? Good grief. Jesus? Can't, no, he surely was not tempted by those sorts of opportunities. Or, uh, vengeance? Nah, Jesus wouldn't have been tempted by any such... A, so it just seems like such... We see opportunities, but temptations, such stumbling blocks, wouldn't even be a second thought. It wouldn't be a big deal to him, we think. Plus, we think it's harder, temptation is harder for us because we've got those weaknesses. And if Jesus didn't have those weaknesses, then how can we possibly compare him being tempted with us being tempted? Surely it's harder for us than it was for him, we think. But let's think about it this way. The longer you resist temptation, the harder it gets. Sometimes the harder, or the longer it goes, the harder it gets for us, right? You might be able to easily, you know, fend off a temptation, you know, in a few seconds, but then you get to thinking about it a little bit more. And then it gets a little more tempting to you. And then you think, well, I, I, there's a way I could do this and I wouldn't get caught. And uh, you know, pretty soon it gets a little harder as it goes along. You try not to think about it, but now you're thinking about not thinking about this thing you want so much, right? Distraction doesn't hold. But because Jesus did not give in to the temptation to sin, the temptation sort of ran its full course. Now, I want, let's switch the metaphor. Let's, let's think of a gauntlet, an obstacle course. It's a ropes course, and it's stuff you got, mud you got to crawl through, and ropes you got to climb, and you got to get over the wall, and then you get, and you got to get under the barbed wire while bullets fly over your head. You know, the marine obstacle course type thing, and you got to get through that thing. And the further you get on the course, the harder it gets, because one, you get wetter, two, you get tired, Right? And three, the obstacles get tougher. Yes. Jesus did not just run the first few steps of the gauntlet. He ran the whole entire thing. Therefore, it was harder for him. We got a few steps in and quit and gave in to the temptation. Jesus went the whole way. Surely, he has gone through all the temptation we've gone through. And he made it through. Now, if you're looking for help getting through that obstacle course, are you going to ask the person that made it halfway through and then couldn't get through anymore? Or are you going to ask Paul Blart Mall Cop? He couldn't make it through that police obstacle course, right? You're not asking Paul Blart. Do not lie to me, Paul Blart. Do not lie to me. He did not make it through the whole obstacle course. But Jesus did. Are you, yeah, he's the one you want to ask. How do you get through that last part? Because that's what trips me up. I can get through to here, and then boom, I stop. How do you get through the last part? Jesus is the one who can help you find your way through. So when you feel yourself running the wrong stuff, and you can sense your resistance weakening, this text is about what to do in that moment. 
This isn't about what to do after you've sinned. There are other texts that talk about that. This is about what you do when your knees are getting weak and you're about to give in. Can you just stop? Can you just stop? Just before you do that thing, can you just stop for a moment and approach the throne of grace with confidence? Jesus is not at that moment shaking his head at you. Because sometimes I think we think that's how he must feel. I can't even believe this is an issue to you right now. What's the matter with you? And we think he's just non-sympathetic, just shaking his head, wanting to slap you upside the head, when in fact he's got his hands out to you saying, this is exactly why I inspired the writer of the Hebrews to say this. I've been there. Come to me. I will help you through this. Now, I preach this to myself, too, because, come on, I mean, I'm, I'm as human as the next person. It's, it's about what we do in the moment of anger, the moment of, you know, desire to gossip, or the d moment of lust, the moment of vengeance, the moment of this, the, whatever, gambling, substance abuse, whatever it is, whatever your temptation is, in that moment, pause and pray. Jesus is empathetic with that. He's been there, and he will help you through. This last uh, way that Jesus meets and exceeds the qualifications for high priest. Jesus has erased more wrongdoing than whiteout. Not including his own, because of course he didn't do anything wrong. But he erased everybody's sins. Everybody's on that cross. Um, there's a little theological phrase we like to use. Jesus' death was efficient for everyone. It was sufficient for everyone, but efficient only for those who believe. Sufficient. It's enough to cover everybody's sins. Unfortunately, not everybody comes to him and repents. So it's efficient for those who believe. But Jesus has got our sins covered. Look at verses 9 and 10. Sin, uh, some though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. What do you mean made perfect? He was sinless. If you've never sinned, you don't need to be perfected. Uh, on the contrary, Jesus being perfect, he was in fact sinless. I forget who it was who recently said that Jesus had sinned. It was some major person on, it was all over Twitter for a while, a, few, a couple months ago or whatever. Jesus never sinned. But he was trained to obey when it hurts. Before the cross, to do that so we can get through the last part of this message without that happening. The cross was a whole special thing. Up until Jesus went to that cross, he had never gone through anything quite like that. This was a test beyond what he had been through. Now, it was, life wasn't easy before that. He was acquainted with suffering and grief before he went to the cross, to some extent or another, of course, normal things in life going on. Losing his friend Lazarus. Hold on one second. Okay? Hold on. Now I'm not going to move. Oh, it's too heavy. Calm down. Hold on. I can't have it this loose when I'm playing drums, but I can have it that loose when I'm not. So we're just going to do that. That's it, right there. <laughs> this is what it's come to. <sighs> okay. Jesus was trained in a level of obedience that was never required of him. He never had to be able and willing to submit to the will of the Father 
when it was most painful. I mean, there's nothing to, to which you can compare crucifixion. We came up with the word excruciating to describe the worst kind of pain possible. And we used the word crucifixion to come up with that word. Excruciating comes from crucifixion. Jesus then, he, he might have dealt with all the you know, weaknesses and difficult, or well, or temp, no, not weaknesses, but temptations. Um, grief, death, he probably had lost Joseph, his, his father, his you know, stepfather in effect, uh, before that, um, and dealt with other, I mean, Lazarus was one of his best friends. He lost Lazarus. There were other griefs that he suffered, persecution. People were trying to trap him, getting, get him killed for some time before they finally did get into that cross. So he was acquainted with grief, but man, to obey the will of the Father to go to the cross was taking it to a whole different, unique level. So that when he calls followers to himself, he says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me because that's like the paradigmatic example of obedience to the will of the Father when it's not convenient. Okay? Jesus then was perfected, was fully qualified for his role as high priest and as king of the world because he was willing to go to that cross. And of course, because we have to follow the way of the cross to reach our glory, our participation in his rule in the world to come, and all of the wonderful promises God has made us about eternal life, in order for us to receive that glorious existence, we have to follow the way of the cross. Now, in this text, in, in this Hebrews 4 and 5, who benefits from the eternal life? that we're talking about. Who benefits from this? Take a good look at verse 9. 5 9 says, those who obey him, those who obey him are the ones who will have eternal life. He became a source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Why? Because oh, faith obeys. I mean, we're saved by faith, not works, but faith obeys. And the Hebrews writer is making no bones about this. The disobedient are faithless and not bound for salvation, but the obedient, those who are increasingly obeying him, have faith. Now, some people think obedience sounds too horrible to even contemplate. They just want to do what they want to do. But just consider the real world alternative to obedience to God. There's another want ad I came across this week. Wanted. Evil genius seeks minions to sacrifice their lives in world domination attempt. Must be prepared to work 24-7 for fascist psychopath for no pay. Here's my favorite part. Messy death inevitable. But costumes and laser death rays provided. That makes up for everything. No weirdos, please. Call 1-900-WAHAHA. <laughs> and then I got to thinking about Bob Dylan. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Bob Dylan. I listened to the song this week. It wasn't a bad song. Yeah. It doesn't even need to be redeemed like some of the like that Leonard Cohen one, right? Oh yeah. Hmm. Well, you got to have something going on if you're going to sing something like this, because the thing is, the world doesn't think this. The world, it, it, people who don't serve the Lord typically think they're doing their own thing. And they don't want to serve the Lord because they don't want to be under authority. They don't want to serve anyone. Right. There's a saying, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven or something like that, right? That's kind of the mentality. Some people just don't want to serve anybody but themselves. Bob Dylan cuts through the lie. The, the illusion that somehow you can walk through this life not serving anybody? No. No. You're either going to serve God or you're going to be serving the devil. 
when you serve yourself, you're serving a devil you don't even believe in. But you're nevertheless, you're following the temptations. Now, he's the one tempting you. You may not think he's the one tempting you, but that's who you're following. You're giving into his temptation. So the writer of the Hebrews is calling us to serve and obey God and to follow in the footsteps of the high priest that he has appointed for us. Because Jesus alone offers us salvation. He said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. He's the way to eternal life. He's the truth. He's, he is the life. Ha to know him is eternal life. And so let us be among those who have eternal salvation by faithfully obeying him. Stand with me and let's pray. Father, we pray, help us to accept the high priestly work of Jesus Christ for our sins. Lord Jesus, your work on that cross erased, wiped out our sins so that we could be forgiven and so that we could move forward without crippling shame and regret. So that we could move forward free and Lord, so that we can move forward and be trained in righteousness, perfected, even as Jesus was, Lord. One day you will finish the work that you've begun in our moral character. You will finish that transformation and we will be like Jesus. We will be obedient. We will be faithful. Um, and, and we will be loving and generous and kind and patient. We will be self-controlled. Lord, we struggle sometimes with those virtues now, but we pray that you would give us the power of your Spirit to help us to be faithful and obedient in greater and greater measure. But Lord, I pray especially that in those moments that we are being tempted with our primary weaknesses, and we've all got our primary weaknesses, one person's weakness is this, another person's weakness is that, but Lord, when we know that we are beginning to be tempted by our weaknesses, we pray that we would just hit the pause button, just stop for a second and pray. Help us to pause and pray because Jesus, you in that moment, that you beckoned us to you in that moment to just take your hand so that you will help us not to fall, not to stumble. And we pray that we would do that. Knowing that you're not shaking your head, you're holding out your hand. You are empathetic, not judgy in that moment. Lord, we pray that you would help us to approach you in that moment. And not lie to ourselves that we are somehow alone. When we feel alone, we just act as if we're alone. Lord, help us in that moment to know you are there and you are there for us. For us, not against us. We pray, Lord, that we would benefit from that profound empathy and compassion that you have for us. Lord, you are the pioneer. You are the one tasked with making your brothers and sisters holy so that we can all stand together unashamed when the world to come, <laughs> uh, when we're all standing in the world to come. And so we pray, Lord, that we would just, just let you do what you do. Let you do your job. Make us holy. Make us pure. Make us right with you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful week.
charger doesn't work with those batteries, I think. So I've got a new battery charger and battery.